autoridades y personal del Planetario, Ciudad de La Plata, miembros de la comunidad académica de la Facultad de Ingeniería y de la Facultad de Ciencias Astronómicas y Geofísicas de la Universidad Nacional de La Plata. Acompañan al señor Bolden personal de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos de América en Argentina, invitados especiales, y a todos aquellos que nos acompañan en directo vía internet a través del portal de la Universidad Nacional de La Plata. Charles Bolden ingresó al Cuerpo de Astronautas de la Administración Nacional de Aeronáutica y del Espacio, NASA, en 1980. Entre 1986 y 1994 ha participado de cuatro misiones espaciales a bordo de los transportadores Columbia, Discovery, en dos oportunidades y Atlantis. Estando a cargo como comandante en dos de esas misiones, sus vuelos incluyeron la puesta en órbita del telescopio espacial Hubble y la primera misión conjunta de Estados Unidos-Rusia en un transbordador espacial. Propuesto por el presidente Barack Obama y avalado por el Congreso de los Estados Unidos de América, desde 2009 está a cargo de la administración de la Agencia Espacial Estadounidense. Su gestión se ha caracterizado por el lema Una nueva era de innovación y descubrimiento, con énfasis en los programas tripulados al espacio profundo, la Administración Bolden se encuentra enfocada en brindar los primeros pasos concretos en vista de un posible viaje humano a un asteroide y del tan ansiado viaje a Marte. Hace 25 años iniciamos una nueva etapa en nuestro continuo e inexorable camino hacia las estrellas, en la historia de la astronomía y en nuestra búsqueda incesante en responder los más grandes interrogantes de la humanidad, comenzaba a escribirse una nueva página, la cual permitiría abrir nuevas y colosales fronteras. El 25 de abril de 1990, desde el Centro Espacial Kennedy, la misión STS-31 Discovery iniciaba su ascenso y con ella, una de las joyas tecnológicas más increíbles que se hayan podido construir el telescopio espacial de Hubble. A 25 años de aquella histórica jornada, los invitamos a compartir esos momentos inolvidables. Señoras y señores, con ustedes, el administrador y ex astronauta de la NASA, Charles Bolden. Rule number one, you can ask questions anytime. 
I'm not sure how I'm going to tell what you asked. Uh, hopefully the interpreter will tell me. Uh, that's rule number one. So ask questions anytime. I'll try to see hands if they go up back there. And rule number two is there are no dumb questions. So uh, anything that, you, that crosses your mind that you decide you want to ask, there's probably someone else uh, here in the audience who wants to ask the same question. And I have to go meet, I met someone earlier. Tell me your name again. You're Julia. So I met, stand up here for a minute if you can. Yeah, I want everybody to see Julia. I know, I know back in the back, you all may not be able to see her, but everything I'm going to talk about today uh, is intended for Julia because she's the one that's going to get to do all the stuff that I'm going to be telling you all about when we talk about NASA's future. So Julia's eight, nine years old. Nine years old. So we're talking about Julia and the things that we talk about today. So if some of you get excited and say, but I can't do that, I'll be dead or something, don't worry about it. Julia will be doing it for you. So um, I'm going to start out just by talking a little bit about who we are. NASA is, um, is the United States' civil space agency. So we handle everything in aeronautics and space for the United States. That means airplanes, uh, unmanned aerial systems, uh, air traffic control systems, uh, then into science, uh, engineering for space systems, human space flight, and now uh, something that we call technology development. So we really are looking for things way out in the future that are going to enable us to do one big thing, which is getting humans to Mars in the 2030s. So you'll hear me talk a lot today about humans to Mars. NASA is comprised of about 18,000 civil servants spread across the United States. We are 10 NASA centers, and a center is like a, like a company headquarters, if you will. So we have 10 NASA centers, three of them out on the west coast of the United States in California, and then several across the Gulf coast of the United States, with the Kennedy Space Center in Florida being where we launch most of the time, and that's where we do all of our human space launches. Uh, Houston, Texas is where the Johnson Space Center is. That's where all the astronauts live and do most of their training. And then we have uh, centers like Marshall and Huntsville, Alabama that develops rockets and uh, Skittish where we test every rocket. And we actually, I come from Washington, D.C., which is where NASA headquarters is. So, so 10 centers around the country. We also have uh, thousands, literally tens of thousands of contract support uh, it comes from some American companies that support us. So when you talk about the NASA family, we're talking about 18,000 civil servants, plus maybe 40 or 50,000 contractors. Um, we're divided into four mission areas, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Their mission, um, the first one is, is devoted to human space flight, and that's the Human Exploration Operations Mission Director. Uh, our legacy in the agency is human space flight. And so you will see that a lot of the things I'm going to show you today will involve humans, although we don't do anything today that's not collaboration between robots or wide systems and humans. So um, the legacy of the agency is pretty much human spaceflight. That's what everybody remembers about NASA. But I, I will show you that we do other things uh, that people sometimes don't think about, like aeronautics in particular. Um, shuttle flew for 30 incredible years. We retired the space shuttle in July of 2011, and then we started on a new course. Uh, we now have turned over access to lower orbit to our commercial partners, our industry partners. So for cargo that goes to and from the International Space Station, much of it for us is carried by two American companies. One is called SpaceX, that I think many of you have heard about, uh, because SpaceX, we have, we have helped Konai select uh, SpaceX to carry one of the Argentine satellites uh, to space in a few years now. Uh, the other company is called Orbital Sciences, and the two of them provide cardinal modules. Orbital Sciences has one called Cygnus, and then SpaceX has one called the Dragon, and they carry cargo to and from space for us. We have now contracted with two other American companies, Boeing and SpaceX again, to build the vehicles that will begin to carry crews to orbit, hopefully by uh, as early as 2017. And what that will do for us is it'll give us, uh, it'll end our reliance on the Russians to get crews to orbit, but it'll give us two redundant American vehicles plus Soyuz uh, that's available to get humans back and forth to the orbit. Um, so that's, that's human exploration. The second big mission directorate is called the science mission directorate. 
And in that is where most of our interaction with um, Argentina occurs, because one of the areas where we work with you an awful lot is in the area of earth science, uh, looking at the effects of climate change, uh, looking at the um, effects of, of the water cycle here on the planet. And so a lot of our work with CONI is, is uh, bilateral activities. For example, Aquarius SAC-D was a satellite that, that we launched and participated in for you back in 2011. Uh, incredibly successful satellite that today maps uh, the oceans of the world and, and their salinity down to like a teaspoon or something even smaller. Uh, an incredibly successful mission for us and for you. And we look forward to future missions that, that will be very similar. We also have an incredible education program with you called GLOBE, where we allow students like you know, to go out and you know, take temperature or take the humidity, go inside, go to the computer, and enter a global website where they can participate uh, as members of the worldwide global team. So it gets students involved very early on, uh, at a very early age. The third mission directorate that I already talked about is aeronautics. And in the aeronautics research mission directorate, we work mostly with the aeronautics industry, um, developing new systems for aircraft. And whether they're unmanned aerial systems or for human flown systems, also working on air traffic management. And that's something we work on uh, with multiple countries around the world. And then finally, the fourth and final mission director is called Space Technology Mission Director. It's the newest of ours, and it's in the Space Technology Mission Director that we develop game changing systems. Uh, we're looking for much faster propulsion. Uh, when we talk about taking humans um, to Mars, Right now, that's an eight-month journey. Uh, we want to cut it down as much as we can, and so we'd love to get it to half. And Space Technology Mission Director is looking at new types of technology for propulsion, uh, new types of technology for, for converting wastewater into fresh water, uh, making new solar cells for power to satellites and the like. So that's kind of what they do. But uh, it all starts with human spaceflight. Here I am just to give you a feel for what it's like. When we go around, when we launch from Earth, um, we go from laying on your back like many of you are right now to, um, oh geez, 17,500 miles an hour. So that's pretty fast. And that happens in eight and a half minutes. So you go from zero to 17,500 in eight and a half minutes. You're going so fast that you create this centrifugal force that actually competes against gravity and causes us to be in orbit. So, so in low Earth orbit, that's how fast we're going. Constantly falling around the Earth, but never getting back because of the speed and the centrifugal force that keeps us out there. This is the effect that it has. It gives you the feeling that you're floating. So you can see my crew here. This was from my third space shuttle mission. Uh, half of us are awake. The other half are asleep because we had 24-hour operations going on on this flight. So half were back in some uh, sleep compartments right behind here while the rest of us were up. You can actually see what happens. This is Dirk from out, one of my crew members. He, this was his first time flying. And he wasn't exactly comfortable just, just being able to hang around, so he put his feet in a foot restraint to keep him from floating away. My co-pilot, Brian Duffy, we're all having a nice deal. This is Dr. Kathy Sullivan. She was America's first woman to walk in space, and that's me. And people asked yesterday, you know, what do you eat? when you're in space. We eat everything. Uh, you work with the dietitians. you plan your meals in advance, and, uh, and, and what they do is they prepare it, take the water out once it's prepared, dehydrate it, and pack it into little packets like this. When we get ready to eat, we add two or three ounces of water, it rehydrates, and then we can put it on a food warmer if it's a hot food, or just if it's a cold food like cereal then we just use the, the water that's already cold anyway. So we, we eat with a fork knife spoon. There you can see Brian Duffy's spoon, just kind of floating there. Uh, because the water, the liquids don't behave very well, we put them in drink containers, and we use a straw to sip from the drink container. When, we, when we're finished, we clip the straw, otherwise you'll end up with water all over the, all over the cabin as it floats up out of the straw. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite, was shrimp cocktail. You can't tell it, but that's what I'm eating there. Uh, this is strawberries, some, some type of greens. That's probably potatoes. So you can tell we have great meals, um, and it's pretty much up to you. We do experiments while we're on orbit. In this particular case, 
Um, I'm actually working with Dr. Franklin Chang. He has some of you who were with me before we came in. Uh, one of your professors here is, uh, is a friend of Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. He actually met him some years ago and, uh, and has a, a plaque that Dr. Chang Diaz gave him. But, uh, but Franklin is a person who was born and raised in San Jose, Costa Rica. Decided as a child that he was going to become an astronaut and told his dad, I need to go to the United States. And his father said, for what? He said, because I'm going to be an astronaut. This is a seven-year-old kid. His dad said, forget it. He said, go back to school and finish school, and then we'll talk about it when you graduate from high school. Ten years later, at the age of 17, Franklin went back to his father. He said, it's time. His dad said, it's time for what? Can you hear this, Julio? Can you, can you, does she have a headset? Okay, good. Because this may be you. So Franklin says, it's time to go to the United States because I want to be an astronaut. And his father tried to talk him out of it, he, he couldn't. So he gave up. His father was an engineer who knew some people in the United States. So he called some folk in Connecticut. And uh, they said, this is my son Franklin. I'm going to go ahead and send him to the United States. He's going to arrive there. I want you to take him, you know, get him enrolled in college. So he enrolled in college and um, came to the United States with $50 in cash, a one-way ticket to Hartford, Connecticut, and the note from the, from the father that said, this is the son I talked about. Humor him for as long as you can, and when you grow weary of him, send him back to Costa Rica. Franklin spoke no English. <laughs> Enrolled at the University of Connecticut, almost flunked out the first year just because of struggling with language. Refused to let anybody help him, taught himself English. Went on to graduate with honors from the University of Connecticut, went to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and earned a PhD in plasma physics. And today, he is considered to be one of the world's foremost plasma physicists. And when I talk about game-changing propulsion, Franklin is actually working on a rocket engine that's called Fascinator. And uh, if Vasmar actually works the way that he expects, it may in fact cut the trip to Mars uh, down to about four months instead of eight months, which would be very helpful. But what Franklin and I are doing here was we were doing an experiment that involved taking my blood and uh, putting some of it in a sampler that uh, was going to come back to Earth where the scientists and the doctors could look at the at blood collected over the, the course of the flight and actually see how our bodies had changed, how they had changed metabolically, how they had changed chemically. We took urine samples, blood samples, samples of saliva, and, and bring those all back to Earth, and the scientists can watch how the body changes, how you lose bone mass, how you lose muscle mass, uh, how the body changes. And so that's some of the research that we do. Um, people ask, and I don't see any hands up yet, so I don't, I don't have any don't have any hands, but usually one of the questions I get is, how do you go to the bathroom in space? This is the space toilet. Uh, looks sort of like your toilet at home. That's the, that's the seat of the commode. Um, you don't, you know, we don't have to, men don't have to go in there and sit down, but we recommend that everybody just go sit down on the commode. These two handles are spring loaded. You lift them up, they rotate in, rest on your thigh, and they'll hold you on the commode so you can read a magazine, or read the newspaper, or do whatever else you want to do. There's a little switch over here that you turn it on. It starts a fan going that creates very light suction that draws the fecal matter down into the tank. And it's kept there until a freighter comes home from the International Space Station, and it burns up during re-entry. When we were flying the space shuttle, it stayed in there until you came back, and then the, the cleanup crew brought this big bag out and threw it away. So they don't go combing through it anymore like they used to do back in the old days. Uh, the urine, this is a urine collection hose. Every crew member has their own funnel. It just goes on the end of that hose. You move it wherever you need to move it. The same vacuum draws the urine down through that into a wastewater tank. The, the difference is with urine, like any fluid, you can just dump it overboard. It uh, kind of turns to ice as soon as it comes out and then sublimates. It goes from solid to gaseous form out in space almost instantaneously. So that's how we go to the bathroom in space. Pretty, pretty convenient and it works pretty well. I talked about, um, talked about the fact that we have now turned over access to lower orbit to, to American industry. That has allowed us at NASA to begin developing two vehicles. One is the launch vehicle that we call the Space Launch System or SLS. Uh, it's in construction right now, underway being built, 
and several places around the United States. It's going to use the old Chalamet engines initially. Uh, this is a modification of the solid rocket boosters from the shuttle era, except it's got one more segment added, so there are five segment solid rocket boosters instead of four like we used to use. And then on top of it is a crew module called Orion. And this is an artist concept of Orion. Orion um, is the first vehicle that's built to carry humans beyond lower orbit in more than 40 years. And we flew the first flight on Orion on December 5th, this past December 5th. It flew to giant orbits of Earth, went all the way out, um, oh geez, 3,500 miles, uh, two orbits, and then came back and re-entered successfully, uh, landed by parachute in the Pacific Ocean. So uh, the, all of our folk are going combing over Orion now to see what we learned from that first flight that will help us as we develop the, the operational versions of the vehicle. Um, I show you, you may wonder, why do I have an asteroid in this picture of Orion and SLS? Well, it's because one of Orion's first flights with humans is going to be to take humans to an orbit of the moon, where we hope to, by that time, to have either brought a small asteroid or a big boulder from a big asteroid and, and transported it from its normal orbit of the sun to an orbit around the moon. Tricky, but we think we can do it. It's called an asteroid redirect mission, where we actually take an asteroid or a part of it uh, with a big robotic vehicle and using solar electric propulsion, just push on it constantly for about a year and a half or two years and cause it to change its course around the sun such that it gets close enough to the moon and gets drawn into the lunar orbit. And that's where uh, Orion with, with an astronaut crew will, will actually rendezvous with the asteroid and we'll do some studies. This is an image of one of the largest asteroids that we know of called Vesta. Uh, it's in the main asteroid belt. We flew a mission called Dawn, a robotic spacecraft, some years ago, and Dawn actually orbited Vesta for one whole year. So these are some images, close-up images from Dawn, from Vesta that were taken by Dawn. Dawn is now on its way to the largest asteroid that we know of in the main asteroid belt, one called Ceres, and it's, um, Roughly about 3,500 kilometers from Ceres now, 35,000, not 3,500, 35,000 kilometers, and closing in on it very, very slowly, uh, and should be there sometime in the spring. So we'll get images similar to this from Ceres, which is the largest asteroid. You say, why do we study asteroids? Well, it's because the asteroids and comets and things like that are sort of the building blocks of our solar system. They are remnants left over from planets that have been formed, like Earth and Mars and Venus and others. And so we can study asteroids and comets and we can learn a little bit more about what, how, this, how our solar system uh, actually formed. In, in our science mission, the record the folk in an area called astrophysics, they ask two questions all the time. How did we get here? You know, how did the solar system form? How did stars form? All this kind of stuff. And then the second question they ask is, are we alone? You know, is there life elsewhere in the universe? So people ask a lot of times, why didn't we pick Mars? Why do you want to go to Mars? One simple reason is the fact that Mars is very Earth-like. At one time in its history, millions and billions of years ago, uh, planetary scientists believed that Mars was very fertile, like Earth. was uh, a warm planet, a temperate planet that had seasons and the like. We actually see evidence now, we know that Mars has lots of water. Most of it is now frozen in the tundra. But we see evidence that at one time when, when Mars was a little bit warmer, it actually had tidal activity. Because you can see that in the, in the sands on Mars. Uh, we have a, a rover called Curiosity that's big. It's the size of Volkswagen. Uh, we landed Curiosity on Mars a couple of years ago, and it's been roaming the planet. It's now climbing a mountain, a giant mountain called Mount Sharp, in the middle of a big crater on Mars. And as it climbs, it's taking samples, and what we're looking for is any evidence of any form of life. So, haven't found it yet, but we believe it may be there. We're trying to demonstrate three things. That life at one time did exist on Mars, that life today may exist on Mars, and that Mars in its present form has enough water and it has a hospitable enough uh, environment that humans can live there for long periods of time in the future. So uh, that's, that's how we happen to pick Mars. Um, I mentioned the fact that we've now turned to industry. These are just examples of what we're looking for, commercial crew, uh, both two companies, SpaceX and Boeing, 
a building space for Air Force now. This is a, an artist drawing of Boeing CST-100. Uh, it'll carry a crew of anywhere from four to seven, and then their plan is to land by parachute, but actually land with, uh, on land. They've got several landing sites out in the western part of the United States, out in the desert, where they plan to land SpaceX and the Dragon here. And that's a picture of Dragon on the International Space Station, but their crew mod, crew mod would be the, the crew Dragon. And right now it's planned to land in the ocean the way they do with the Dragon module today. But they're also developing what they call a propulsive landing system that will enable Dragon one day to come back and land on land just very smoothly using retro rockets to just let it come to a gentle landing. So um, these are the two companies that are working on commercial crew for us. Uh, they should be available in about 2017, so two years from now. And then we'll be completely free of dependence on the Russians the way we are for getting our crews to work. I talk about aeronautics, um, and I use this as my, my big demonstrator. It's a Boeing 787. Many of you may have flown on a 787. When you get aboard, it's a lot different from any other airplane you've ever been on. Other than the fact it's really big, it also has a much higher uh, cabin pressure than a normal airplane, so you get much more oxygen in the air circulation. So when you get off a long flight of Boeing 787, you don't feel quite as fatigued as you do on some other airplanes. Uh, the air that circulates is much cleaner. Uh, it's a composite structure, so the, the skin of the airplane is almost all composite. It's not aluminum the way that most airplanes have been. The engines are very high efficiency engines, very clean burning, very quiet. Um, and most of this is the result of a lot of NASA research that the Boeing company, along with Airbus and others, uh, took from our aeronautics research and put into airplanes. The cockpit itself uh, looks in many ways like the inside of the International Space Station. And what we're doing now is we're taking some of the, the cockpit technology that Boeing put into the 787 and we're converting it back to the International Space Station. So if you were able to go to the International Space Station today, you would see that we now have mood and lighting. Uh, if you've been on a 787, you know that the captain can change the lighting inside. You know, if, if he wants it to be, wants you to be real soothed, he turns it pink. Uh, you know, he may turn it blue. And so we found that that, that has a, a marked effect on just how a person feels. So we now have um, high energy lighting in the International Space Station as a result of them taking our technology, putting it on this airplane, finding out how it works, and now getting ready to take it back and put it on the International Space Station. So a constant interplay between industry and, and government uh, as we develop systems that industry can use we watch how they develop it and perfect it, and then we take it back and use it in some of our some of our applications. But that's aeronautics. That's that's and this one is actually it's a Boeing Eco Demonstrator. The name comes from the fact that we're working in collaboration with Boeing over the next year to put new systems on this airplane to see just how about can we burn biofuels? Uh, what kind of fuels can we put on here to make it even cleaner burning than it is today? Are there ways that we can improve the efficiency of the engine? So uh, an ecology demonstrator is what this airplane is. This is Curiosity that I talked about earlier. It's, a, it's an artist concept. Curiosity has a number of selfies now. Uh, it's been on the surface of Mars for a little bit more than two years. And like many of you, Curiosity has cameras all over it. So, so it takes selfies of, its, of itself all the time. And then we build composites. So we actually have some pictures of Curiosity that are real that look like this. This one's not. Um, Curiosity is an interesting beast. Um, it actually, this is a weather station. This whole mass, uh, these are anemometers. They measure wind direction and speed. The weather station uh, was built by the Spaniards just outside of Madrid, Spain, in the, in the uh, Astrobiology Center uh, for the Spanish. Up until Curiosity landed on Mars, there had only been one nation to ever land and successfully operate on, on Mars, and that was the United States. As a result of having Curiosity there and all of our partnerships, there are now five nations that physically have things operating on the surface of Mars, and about 15 nations that are collaborating on this because a number of the principal investigators looking at some of the scientific investigations on Curiosity are from countries other than the United States. So, a lot of our, most of our work is, is international collaboration. The reason I'm here in Argentina this week 
um, is to reemphasize the strong partnership that the United States and Argentina have in space exploration, science, and technology development. Um, to come down and talk a little bit to people like you about the partnership that gave us Aquarius SAC-D, about some of the partnerships that we're getting ready to do with another satellite we're building right now. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an L-band synthetic aperture radar. It's gonna, it fits very nicely into our suite of Earth-observing satellites. Um, and so it's, it's just to make sure that we keep the partnership between our two nations as strong as possible in, in space exploration and science. Um, so that's curiosity. Um, this is my favorite image. This is taken on my second flight when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. And I don't know how many of you, you remember the, the image of Hubble floating away from the shuttle right after we deployed it? That was my crew a long time ago, 1990, when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. We literally lifted it out of the payload bay with a mechanical arm and then turned it loose. If you were looking at the ground, at that time, you actually saw your home country. Because when we released Hubble, we were just coming off the Pacific Ocean and we were crossing right about where Argentina, Peru, and in, uh, I forget what the other country is, but we were going like right across the border there. And so Hubble floated away from us, and because it was now going at the same speed we were, 18,000 miles an hour, Hubble was, took about 10 minutes to get across the continent of South America. And it, it goes around Earth just like, just like we do, once every hour and a half. So Hubble makes one orbit of Earth every hour and a half. And like humans, it sees 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. So daylight is 45 minutes and darkness is 45 minutes. But this is one of my favorite parts of the world. Uh, that space, by the way, in daylight, just black, dark because our sun is so powerful that it just completely overwhelms the ability of the eye to discern stars in, in the daylight. So this 45 minute period of daylight, we don't see any stars. That's our atmosphere, that thin blue line. If you didn't think about it before, it gives you a real strong feeling of how important it is to take care of the environment. How fragile our atmosphere and we are, uh, because that's, that's the only thing that keeps us alive. That's all the oxygen in the world, and it's very fragile. This is Western Saudi Arabia, the Sinai Peninsula, the Gulf of Ottawa and Jordan. Israel's right up here under the clouds. This is northeastern Egypt with the Nile River running up here, and um, absolutely breath breathtaking to look at it from space. Just incredible. The beauty of all the fields where the farmers are doing stuff, it just looks like a really, really peaceful place. And then you think about what's going on down there, and uh, it, you begin to reflect and say, okay, what's wrong? You know, why is it not really that way? And what can I do to make it better? So you, you come back really kind of struggling to figure out, okay, what can I do to make this better? And believe it or not, there may be some things that I can do or we can do to make it better. Um, I'm going to, I'm getting ready to go to questions, but I want to, I tell you what I'll do, I'll leave that up. And let me see if there are questions from any of you now, because we've got, we've got time for questions. And I, were they going to have a mic, or are people just yelling out? Who knows? Just yell? Yes, just yell. Any questions? Oh, this is really hard. Yes. Did you? Oh, up there. I got you. OK. The objective to put an asteroid and, and the moon's orbit. Why? Why put it there? Yes. Uh, the reason that we're trying to move the asteroid is multi-fold. Multi we want to be able to get. President Obama told us back in 2010, some time ago, that he wanted NASA to put astronauts on an asteroid by 2025. Uh, there were a number of options. You know, do you try to send astronauts all the way to the main asteroid belt? That's farther than Mars. So that was very, very hard. We had, so we said, how about if we asteroids are visited by Earth all the time? Uh, close passage is really anything that's just outside the moon or just inside the moon. If we can find a way to rendezvous with one of those robotically uh, and coax it to, to get out of its path over toward the moon, the moon's gravity will overcome that of the sun and draw it into its orbit. 
we demonstrate the fact that you can, in fact, conserve an asteroid. So down the road, if people want to try to save the planet, they'll have the information that we gathered from the Asteroid Redirect Mission on, on how you go about um, just uh, de de detracting an asteroid or diverting it or whatever. So that's, that's one of the reasons for the work that we're doing. The other one is to allow us to have an opportunity to, to develop technologies and procedures that will enable people to work with asteroids. There are a lot of private companies and entrepreneurs who talk about mining, mining the moon, mining asteroids and the like. So the technologies that we develop and the procedures for operating around an asteroid, which is a zero gravity to low gravity environment, uh, will enable people down the road to go do that. If, if there is a business there, it will help to, to lay the groundwork for that. Okay. Yes? As I understand, the Asteroid Redirect Mission needs 15 more years to become a success. Is that true? He was saying, his question was, he understands that Mars, our, our effort to put humans on Mars needs 15 more years to be successful. Uh, probably needs more than that to be truly successful. But we are, in fact, 15, probably 15 years away from having sufficient robotic vehicles on the surface and in orbit, and actually having humans who, who will probably be in orbit around Mars in the next 15 to 20 years. Actually, putting people on the surface is a, that's another hurdle. Uh, but what we're working on now is thinking about what type of architecture should we have for a Mars landing system? Uh, where do humans live? We pretty much have decided you won't live on the surface. Uh, Mars still is a relatively high radiation environment, so you won't just walk around the way we do here on Earth. Humans will go back to caves. We essentially will move underground. Um, the importance of, of developing the robots that we do today is because we won't put people at risk to go build the habitats. We'll use a, a, a mini army of robots who will go to Mars first and build the habitat so that people then come and move right in. So we're, it's a long, uh, it's a step-by-step -step program. We have a plan that is very, it's, it's, um, it's an evolutionary plan to, to physically put humans on Mars. But you're right, 15 years from now, uh, humans should be in the, in the Martian environment. The next stop for us, now that we have commercial lower orbit, taking place is to put humans back in orbit around the moon, back into cis-lunar space, as we call it. And we call it the proving ground. So it's an area where, for about five or ten minute, um, years, beginning in the late part of this decade into the mid to late part of the 20s, uh, is we'll develop, continue to develop the technologies that we need to close the gap on sending humans to Mars. Uh, develop procedures for working around lower body, lower gravity bodies on Earth, um, and then get ready to move on to Mars. So humans are going to operate around the moon for about five or ten years. Some will go to the surface again, uh, because there are private entities, there are other countries who want to go down to the surface of the moon, and we'll be working with them to help, help them do that. Yes? This is Mike right there. Yeah. Talk a bit about the international partnership between NASA and other space agencies around the world. But what I would like to know is if it's possible to currently partner up with private companies in the US considering the current, the current regulatory frame given by the international traffic and arms regulations. And if not, and if it's actually very restrictive, as I do believe it is, what can NASA do to address this issue and how can we? Better than industry. And I'm going to try to answer that, but I brought my expert in ITAR and all that stuff with me. This is Mr. Mike O'Brien, whose who's kind of hand is up down here. We, we affectionately call him Obi, uh, like Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, he's a pilot as I am and everything, but, but Mike heads our international relations office, and, and Cherie, who is here, actually is in charge of us for this trip. Cherie's specialty is South America and Latin American countries. They spend a lot of their time working with the U.S. State Department and what we call the interagency process back in the United States to make sure that we don't violate any of those kinds of regulations. But there are ways for us to collaborate both with American industry and with international partners. So there's some things that we can't, you know, we can't trade in, we can't give technology about launch vehicles and the like. But other things you talked about 
about specifically, for example, asteroid mining and yes. there's going to be these days based in the US. Well, if, for example, let's say that company wants to launch their, their vehicles using a larger time yeah. launch vehicle, yeah. they will have a bit of a problem, won't they? No, not at all. And, you know, the good thing about what NASA does is everything we do goes into the public domain. So one of the things that we're, we're working with Argentina right now on the SOCOM uh, SAR satellite is we, we're a partner, but what we want to make sure is that Argentina adopts our policies about open access to data. So, you know, if we're going to partner with Argentina on L-band synthetic aperture radar, that's going to answer lots of questions about, about the environment. We really would like to have that go into, into the open source data so that any country, anybody, anywhere can gain access to it. Okay? And that's the case of most of the things we do. Um, we, we do very little work that is classified and that, that, that does not go into the public domain. Um, don't know whether, I think hopefully that answers your question. So, yes. We almost don't do anything, as a matter of fact, that's not that we don't have an international partner. And we, we find ways to sign, like I will sign a framework agreement this afternoon uh, with CONI and, and the ministry under which they, they operate, the Ministry of Public Planning and more, 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 okay? Um, but we'll sign an official agreement and it will be an international, essentially a, a treaty between NASA, the United States, and Argentina through CONI uh, that says we are going to collaborate um, an umbrella agreement, but it says we're going to collaborate on future work uh, together on, on earth science, synthetic atmosphere radar, and, and the like. And actually this one is in heliophysics, studying the sun, so it's a little bit different. It expands the amount of work that, that we'll be doing together. So we'll be partnering with Argentina on studying space weather. Question over here, yes? And then here. Oh, Mike, do we have a mic? I'll repeat it if you, or maybe you have an interpreter who's got it. No, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Are you going to just say it out loud? Can, can you hear this question, the interpreter? I'm going to say it out loud. Not the one I'm Ah. <laughs> Great. Now you can go. <laughs> oh, hold, hold, hold on one. I, I, I can hear. Yeah. She said there's a mic right up here. They're going to bring you a mic. So there's a question up here, I think. Dijo que uno de los mayores problemas que tenemos para vivir en Marte es que no tenemos una fuerte energía renovable que no sea solar. Este, me gustaría saber si estás de acuerdo y qué puede hacer la NASA para mejorar eso. You know, actually, but, and I, I, I don't remember Chris saying that, and I, I don't doubt that he did. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we are looking at ways to expand solar energy so that that does become a form of natural energy that we can use places like Mars. We have a satellite called Juno uh, that is on its way to Jupiter, to uh, one of the outer planets. What makes Juno very unique is that it's solar powered. Up until Juno, everything that we sent to the outer planets had to have a nuclear power source or you know, thermal nuclear generator or something. Juno is actually using advanced technology solar cells. So we think that solar cells may be able to work on Mars. Now, Curiosity uh, has a, a, a nuclear power plant, you know, that's, that's supposed to last for 10 years. But we're looking for other types of energy that are other than nuclear um, and, and maybe could be solar. Um, right here. Sí, son dos preguntas puntuales nada más. Yo soy el doctor Vicente Ciancio, de la Facultad de Ciencias Médicas de esta universidad. Y quería preguntarle algo de su experiencia. Usted voló justamente en ese vuelo para colocar el satélite, que todos lo vimos, pero eso tenía un riesgo más importante porque usted va a una altitud el doble de la que normalmente tienen los vehículos estacionados y volando en el espacio. Eso significa una exposición mucho mayor a 
radiaciones cósmicas y galácticas y solares que son totalmente diferentes a las que conocemos en México. Entonces, me imagino que ustedes deben tener, o la NASA le debe dar, los datos de los niveles de radiación que recibieron en ese momento. Y, por otro lado, también como médico, nosotros que hemos realizado los estudios ya en más bajo nivel de esa radiación, donde también se reciben radiaciones, por ejemplo, en el piloto, y él lo debe conocer, y tenemos los estudios del impacto de esas radiaciones que se producen justamente en el genoma, que es la parte más importante de cualquier célula de nuestro organismo. Y ahí producen lesiones que son muy, muy severas y que se ven en diversos padecimientos, sobre todo el cáncer. El hecho es que yo quisiera saber si ¿sí? tienen los niveles de radiación en las unidades que se refieren al informe internacional y si a usted, los médicos, le han realizado estudios citogenéticos para ver el impacto de esas radiaciones que tienen mucha importancia luego en el seguimiento futuro. Son esas dos preguntas. Bien, we we have um, throughout the time the whole course of human spaceflight, we've always measured radiation on the person. Everybody wears dosimeters or dosimeters in the cabin and the like. So we, we pretty much know what the radiation environment is like in lower orbit. We now know what the radiation environment is like between here and Mars because Curiosity had, uh, had a radiation monitoring device on it. So we've mapped that and we now know pretty well what the radiation environment on the surface of Mars is. That, along with studies by independent organizations like the one you referenced, um, have given us the satisfaction that the, the radiation to which a human would be exposed on a journey to Mars is um, is extreme. It's much much more than we would see just walking around here on Earth or flying around in you know in the air here on Earth. But that it's not so much to the extent that it will result in death of a crew member. The concern for us is long-term health, is quality of life after one comes back. So if I'm a Martian astronaut and I go to Mars, or if Julia goes, uh, and she comes back, is she going to be healthy and happy and be able to have kids and do all that other kind of stuff 20 years after she returns from her journey? So that, that's one of the medical questions we're still trying to answer. So we gather data from astronauts on the International Space Station. Um, we're going to gather a year's worth of data from Scott Kelly and a, a Russian cosmonaut by the name of uh, Mikhail Konyinko, who are going to launch at the end of March and fly for one whole year. Um, so we're constantly gathering data. The, the concern for us now is no longer life of an astronaut to and from, but quality of life for an astronaut when they return. We have today the limits on how much a person can be exposed to radiation. Normally, we'll allow a crew member to fly two increments, maybe three on the International Space Station, because that's 18 months in the, you know, lower orbit radiation environment. The big thing we're worried about is what we call galactic cosmic rays, the big heavy particles. Um, but there's a lot of research going on in the same area as, as you talked about. Some, some people are actually looking at uh, prophylactic methods of you, you give an astronaut a pill and it enables the body to repair itself. Now, we're not, we're not even close to that yet. But those are the kinds of things that, that we're thinking about. And that's why, you know, 15 years from now, we'll be in the Martian environment. That's a, that's a long time, but it's a short time if you're trying to answer the questions you want. And, and I'm going to have one more question, and then I'm, they're going to make me go. So, and I'll, I'll catch you again, but let me ask Deborah a question, okay? And then I'll come back. I'll get you after we finish. My concern is about is, uh, is there any sort of legislation about commercial companies going to the moon, going to asteroids? Because sometimes yeah. it's very dangerous. That yeah, you know, it's interesting. The question for those of you who may not have heard or, uh, or didn't understand it, she had the question about is there legislation about uh, commercial companies going to asteroids or going to the moon going to do other things. Uh, it is a it is a new is a it's an emerging area of law. Uh, there is this the, the, the area is called space law, believe it or not. The United Nations is working on uh, you know peaceful uses of outer space. So we sign conventions that say that we won't do anything that that, that detracts from peaceful uses of outer space. 
There are people who are looking at the issue of asteroid mining, you know, property rights. Who owns an asteroid or who owns the property? Can you go and, and you know, plot out a piece of land and say, okay, this is mine like the miners did in the U.S. in the old days, the Wild West days. Um, those things have not been settled yet, so the lawyers are working probably as hard as we are on the technological side trying to figure out what the policy is going to be. When you talk about people inhabiting other places other than Earth, so more, more to be decided. I, you all have been great, and they're gonna, I've got to go, but I uh, wanted to leave you with one thing. Remember the image I showed you of the Middle East, and I said how beautiful it is, and I asked the question, what can we do? I'll tell you a story, and hopefully it'll help you. Um, this is the story of a young African boy by the name of Nkosi Johnson. And Nkosi was born in a very small village in South Africa called KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Um, his mother had AIDS, and I think everybody in here knows about the disease AIDS. And his mother was pretty sure that she would die either before he was born or after he was born. And she had a friend, a young white woman by the name of Gail Johnson. She approached Gail and said, look, if I die after, after my son is born, um, would you take him in and raise him for me? She said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. And shortly after Nkosi was born, his mother did in fact die from AIDS. And Gail Johnson took him in and, and began to raise him. And Gail and everybody who knew Nkosi said, this was no ordinary kid, not at all. Because from the moment he could speak, he was telling people, we need to do this for the village. You know, like you probably tell your mom and dad sometimes, we need to do this, we need to do that. If we're gonna make this place better, we need to think about this. That's the way he grew up. And everybody said he was just, just abnormal that way. Eventually, he and, and his adoptive mother, Gail Johnson, traveled around Africa. They traveled around the world, crusading against AIDS, looking for a solution, but also trying to figure out ways to help people live better together. An American writer by the name of Jim Wooten heard about him, traveled to South Africa and met him, and, uh, and did an interview with him, and he said, why do you do what you do? And then Kosi said, I may be poor, I may be black, I may have AIDS, but in this world, we're all the same. And so Jim Wooten came back and wrote a very short uh, biography of Kosi Johnson and told about the incredible life of this kid who at the time was like 10 or 11 years old. I mean, this was not a grown man, this was a kid. And Jim came back and his book came out and he got a call from some friends and said, hey Jim, if you want to see Kosi again, you better hustle because he's on his deathbed. He's not going to live very much longer. Jim went back to Africa, went back to the village, and, and he sat at Nkosi's bedside. And he said he talked to Nkosi, and Nkosi was there, sore as a pus, uh, weighed about 20 pounds or less. And he's a 12-year-old kid, so just, just frail. Um, and he said that Nkosi was smiling and barking out orders to people. We need to do this. We need to fix this. We need to do all this stuff. And Jim Wood said, said, stop. Just stop. He said, you're going to die. And he said, and Kosi looked up at him and smiled and he said, yep. He said, you could die today. He said, and Kosi looked up at him and smiled and he said, yep. He said, well, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I'm told you never cried out in pain. You have never asked for anything for yourself. They have a hard time getting you to take your medication. All you're doing is trying to fix things for other people. Why in the world do you do that? He said, and Kosi looked up at him and he smiled and he said this. He said, you do all you can with what you have, and the time that you have, and the place that you are. So, like I said, this is for you this whole day. So you have to help your dad and everybody else in here do all you can with what you have, and the time that you have, and the place that we all are to make this world a better place. You all are incredibly powerful, you know, when you do what you know is right for your country, for the world, and everything else. So, I wish you all Godspeed. Thanks so very much for letting me spend time with you. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Señor Charles Bolden, en agradecimiento por su visita a la Universidad Nacional de La Plata, La Plata, 19 de febrero de 2015. Entrega el presente del señor presidente de la Universidad Nacional de La Plata, licenciado Raúl Perdomo, la señora decana de la Facultad de Ciencias Astronómicas y Geofísicas 
doctora Alicia Cruzado, el señor decano de la Facultad de Ingeniería, doctor Marcos Artis, y los responsables del Planetario Ciudad de la Plata, licenciado Diego Bagú y técnico Martín Schwartz.